Before I moved here, I did kind of an inventory uh, while I was preparing for this sermon, uh, which is a couple of years old, actually, but that doesn't matter. You, you sort of expect that, don't you? Um, but I was looking around, thinking about this passage, and realized that in the basement I had a turntable for a stereo that I'd never owned. A set of encyclopedias that was uh, from the year our oldest son was born. He's 29 now. A uh, number of empty picture frames. In the shed, I had a couple of power tools that were worn out. A, a small pot barbecue that had one leg missing. A bicycle that uh, no one was riding anymore. An axe, a dull axe. And in the bathroom closet, there was a couple of electric razors. Even though I've never used an electric razor. Some of those things were there because I thought I might need them someday. Some of them were there because I thought, well, maybe the children would need them someday or want them someday. Some, honestly, because after my father died, my mother was, when I, we'd visit, she would say, well, could you take care of this, which was my dad's. And so even though I had no use for it, we would to get, take it, um, to get it off my mother's mind, I would take it home and it would just sit in my house for a while. I mean, who will get what you've prepared for yourself. Who will get all that you have prepared for yourself? I think all of us know the bite of that question a little bit, and my example really isn't as extreme as some, because my parents actually moved a couple of times in their lives. At one point, they moved from Ontario to Grand Rapids, another time from Grand Rapids to Mexico, then back to Ontario, and then from Ontario to Costa Rica. And so, at a number of times, my parents got rid of almost everything they owned. So now even at this point in our lives, as we're thinking about mom's next transition, we don't have a lot of things that have a lot of historical value. But a lot of people do. I heard of a, someone who started out a service to help people deal with their parents' stuff because they realized that, that, that we not only have one generation stuff, we have multiple generations. So my mom, for example, might have stuff that she got from her mother who got from her mother. And so when someone is downsizing, moving, we're dealing with three generations of things. What will you do with everything that you have prepared for yourself? We still face that question, who will get all that you've prepared for yourself? The theme for this Sunday is prepare. It's a good Advent theme. It is what John the Baptist uh, proclaimed, the message that comes from Isaiah, pre pre Isaiah, prepare the way for the Lord. It's what I, uh, John the Baptist was called to do when, when, when he, he was called to make ready a people who are prepared. Prepared for the Lord. John was sent to get people ready. And yet in this reading that we've had this morning, that word prepare shows up in another, another way. In that question, who will get all that you have prepared for yourself? And it reminds us in some ways that we do know how to prepare that we do prepare and we prepare partly because, well, not every year is a good year. I lived for a while in the state of South Dakota in the U.S. And I noticed after a while that, that every once in a while you'd be driving down the field and you'd see this massive pile of hay. And sometimes it looked like it had been there for years. Now, as someone who'd grown up in Ontario, you know, wrestling small uh, square bales up into stuffy, hot haylofts, I wondered, like, why would anybody go through all that work of putting up hay only to save it in the field where it would, would kind of rot away? When I was asked, I was told that, well, in the Dakotas, people knew that not every year is a good year. The part of the state that we lived in was actually fairly close to the eastern border, so the land was much more like Iowa and Minnesota than, say, western South Dakota. It was all rolling hills and corn and grain, corn and soybeans. But you only had to drive about 20 minutes west when you started to realize that the landscape became more open, the fields were bigger, there were fewer trees, fewer farm places, fewer row crops and more pasture land, more, more hay crops. It was more uh, a, a drier climate already. 
And in a good year, that grass would grow abundantly and farmers could put up as much hay as they wanted. But in a dry year, there might not even be enough for the animals to eat. And so after years of hard experience, they just put up all the hay they could when it was good in the hopes that they would have enough fodder when the dry years would come. Not every year is a good year. Now the farmer in the parable that Jesus told had a good year. So good in fact that he didn't know where to put all the grain that had grown. And so he decided that he would tear down all of his barns, all of his storage facilities, all of his silos and granaries and build all new barns and storage facilities and silos and granaries so that he would have enough to get him by. He decided to take down everything and build new. And even if that sounds extreme, I think we get it. I mean, we may not build bigger barns, but we try to build a cushion. I mean, if you listen to the experts, we're told that you should have like six months of, of disposable income set aside in, a, in, in, in some kind of an easily accessible account so that if something happens, you have six months living stored up for you. We may not build barns, but we build resumes. And we look at, at, at all of the activities and all of the things that we can in order to kind of position ourselves for the future. And that starts young. I've noticed as my children were going through high school, the intense pressure some children feel in, in like grades 11 and 12 to get into the right program. To know what they're going to do for the rest of their lives because we're afraid that if you don't start out right, your, your earning potential is going to be damaged for the rest of your life. We don't build barns, but we build portfolios. And I can't think of the number of times I've been told that, you know, you can't just count on a workplace pension. You can't just count on Canada pension. You have to set a aside amount for yourselves in order to assure that your retirement, you won't be bereft. And a smart person prepares the way. We can't help but prepare. Even though we know that life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And we do know that. Over the years, I think some of the examples that I've used that got the most response have to do with this. You mentioned, for example, the, I could mention, for example, the 100 Things Challenge. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that. But there are people a number of years ago who would challenge themselves to live with just 100 things. To reduce all of their possessions to 100 things. Now, there's a bit of slack in there. I mean, you could count your cutlery door as, drawer as one thing. Or, or your sock drawer as one thing. I would be tempted to say my library was one thing. But to live with just 100 things, and the people who would, and would do that, and, and you know, with varying degrees of legalism, as you can imagine, would suggest that life is better when you reduce your possessions. Life does not consist in the abundance of things. I could mention the 100 Things Challenge or, or, or more recently you could think of the Marie Kondo uh, phenomena where you know everything is to be treated with respect and that if you look, go through your things and something doesn't spark joy, you get rid of it. Or you could think of the tiny house movement. People choosing to live in houses that are basically trailers. Though if you see them on HGTV, some of those are look better, nicer than our houses, but that's a whole other story. You can think of all of these examples, and like I said, these examples seem to kind of strike a chord with people because there is something about voluntary simplicity that, 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 that appeals to us in a way, even if it seems beyond our, our reach, we, we, we get that we have too much stuff. And we know that life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. I mean, when we moved here, I can't remember the number of trips I made to Goodwill to get rid of things that just weren't worth moving. 
I know I made three trips to the dump with my you know, four by seven foot trailer packed to the top. And when we get here, yet we don't know where to put our stuff. I got rid of a third of my library, but I still have books that I don't read, that I haven't opened in years. My closet still has clothing that might fit someday. My workbench still has multiple containers with screws, fasteners, and a variety of things that you know, might come in handy someday. You know, we have plenty of good things laid up for many years. When we hear the man in the parable say that, I have plenty of good things laid up for many of years. That might kind of create a sort of picture in our mind, something like what's on the screen. You know, a life of ease, a life of indolence, just simply, you know, relaxing and enjoying, taking in all the experiences that that you want without any, any, any hassle or worries. And even if that sort of lifestyle of the rich and famous image that maybe kind of goes through our minds when we hear him say, yeah, I'll just take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry, because there's plenty of good laid up for many of years. Even if we imagine that it's a life of indolence and luxury, he might not be that different from us. I'll take life easy, he says. Now, the Greek word that's used there, uh, anapao, is not a very common word. In fact, Luke doesn't use it again to take life easy. But it is a word that shows up in the Gospel of Mark when Jesus uh, greets the disciples who've just come back from missions and they're, they're, they're tired and exhausted and, and, and in, in a context where, where uh, one of the Gospels says Jesus didn't even have time to eat. Jesus says to the disciples, let's go find a quiet place and get some rest. Take it easy. And that's something we understand. I mean, it's not just a life lived on a beach for the rest of your life, but the break from the hustle, the bustle, the activity of of the world. And that's something we yearn for. That word in the Greek language also shows up in the Greek Old Testament or or translation of the Old Testament when when it's talking about the day, the year of Jubilee, the year where all debts were canceled and everything was restored. When when good news was preached to the poor, the eyes of the blind would see, the lame would walk. It's a word, in other words, that can also call into mind the eternal Sabbath that God has in mind for the people of God. That time that we look forward to when the stresses and the worries are gone. And we can get some rest. And so the man in the parable, though he seems very selfish, his desires aren't that far removed from us. He wants to have some rest, to take some life easy. He says, eat, drink, and be merry. For you have many good things stored up for you. There's plenty of good. And that word, be merry, in the Greek, eufino, is more common than the word anapao. And Luke does use it in another place. Luke uses it in the story of the prodigal when the prodigal returns home and the father says, let's kill the fatted calf and let's have a feast and celebrate Let's be merry. And in that context, we can understand that that ideal to be merry is not that far from removed from what we want. It's not simply a life of, of un, um, a self-indulgent pleasure, but it can be what we're actually preparing for at this time of year. We want to get ready together with our families and be merry. We want to have a feast and be merry at Christmas. We want to get together with our co-workers and be merry. We want, and we know that sometimes goes overboard, but what we're looking for is some joy. The kind of joy experienced by a father whose son has returned. Be merry. And so though in the context of the parable, 
and the selfishness of a man who sees only his own needs and just stores up thinking that his life is taken care of, at root there, there's something we could identify with, the desire for rest or peace and the desire for joy or merriment. But you put it in those terms. And kind of, that's what we prepare for, but in our preparations we realize that we forget that it's only God who can provide those things. It's only God who can provide peace and joy. Now, perhaps you notice that Jesus told this story kind of as an interruption to answer someone who'd interrupted his teaching. The story begins, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance. And we notice that this parable is given in response to an interruption, but uh, we don't often pay attention to what comes before it, to the teaching Jesus was interrupted in. And in that, Jesus is giving warnings and encouragement. He's telling them not not to be afraid of those who can kill the body, but he'll show you who to fear. Telling them that what's hidden in the darkness is going to be proclaimed in 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 the housetops, that they'll be brought before synagogues and rulers and authorities. Jesus is warning them that they need to prepare for all that's coming. And he can be prepared, but, but we, and it reminds us that we want to be prepared partly because we know not every year is a good year. We know that we have to put something away so we can ride out uncertain times. And that's what Jesus is actually telling his disciples before someone interrupts him and he tells this story of the rich fool. And the way Jesus tells us to prepare beforehand is to not worry. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body. Do not worry about what you're going to say or how you're going to defend yourself for the Spirit will teach you at that time what you can say. Jesus says this before the interruption. Do not worry. Do not be afraid. Do not, you know, worry about how you will defend yourself. But then again, after the interruption, he comes back to those same kinds of words because after telling this story about a man who put away things, thinking that he had his whole life figured out and everything was in control, then Jesus said, do not worry about your life, what you will eat. Who of you can worry, um, by worrying can add a single life? Do not worry about what you will eat, what you will drink. See, Jesus says one way to prepare is is not to worry. Do not worry. And before that, he says that um, uh, he compares, both before and after, he, he mentions birds. Before the interruption, Jesus points to the sparrows and says, Don't you know you're worth more than sparrows? And then afterwards, Jesus points to the ravens and he said, how much more valuable you are than those birds. And so in this context, Jesus is telling them that not every year is a good year, that bad times are going to come, that times that we would think we need to be prepared for. And Jesus is preparing us for those things, but he's giving us another way to prepare. And one of the ways we prepare is by not worrying, and another is by being rich towards God. See, in between those two where Jesus says, don't worry about what's going to come. Don't worry about your body. Jesus tells this story, and he says, this is what happens to those who are store up things for themselves but are not rich towards God. And Jesus unfolds that, what that means when he says, yeah, to be rich towards God, partly when he says, by, um, pay attention to the birds, pay attention to the sparrows. Pay attention to what God gives us. See, part of being rich towards God means paying attention to what God gives us. 
The man in the parable did not realize that he had done nothing to earn that massive harvest, that it was a gift from God to use in a way that honored God and honored others. We begin to be rich towards God when we pay attention to what God's given to us. And so part of an Advent preparation might be spending this month thinking about what we have what God has already given us, making lists of what we've received instead of gifts of things that we want to receive, making lists of things that we've been blessed with instead of gifts that we want, uh, lists of things that we want, extra things that we want. Preparing an Advent calendar, perhaps, that lets us pay, give thanks each day of the season for one thing that God has given to us. Part of being rich towards God is paying attention to what God gives. And if, it pay, if it, being rich towards God includes paying attention to what God's given, it also then includes using the gifts that God has given to bless others. After this interruption, when Jesus says, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, Consider the ravens. Sell your possessions. Give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And giving stuff away might seem like a strange way to get ready for uncertain times when we're worried about whether we will have enough. And yet there's something about that action of giving that reminds us of what we've already been given. There's something about the action of giving that reminds us that God has been gracious to us already. When we give, we can learn the peace and joy that are only provided by God. But we forget, and it's easy to forget. A few years ago, Marsha and I had the opportunity to go on a trip to Israel. It was something that kind of came that we were never really expecting. And I knew there were some aspects of that that would be kind of a challenge for me because part of that involved spending 16 days on a bus with 30 other people, and that's just not my idea of a good time. And part of that was involved spending on a, you know, 16 days on a bus with 30 other people, 15 of whom were other pastors, and, uh, you know, in other words, with... 15 other people who had to be the smartest person in the room. (laughs) And I also knew from the the orientation stuff that the personality of the leader, of the teacher, could is the kind of personality that could really get under my skin. And there was a few times when it did, when when I wasn't really prepared, when when there was a couple of dicey moments along the way, but then there was a certain point when I just kind of woke up and realized that this was a gift. And the church had given me the, 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 the three weeks off. The, you know, some organization had given this group of pastors the opportunity to experience this. And so even though there was irritations along the way, it was a gift and I was being foolish if I just let the irritations ignore that. And that sort of made all the difference. Because when you realize something's a gift, you can take kind of what comes. And you can relax and enjoy what's been given. So when we realize that life is a gift and that God has blessed us richly, we learn that only God provides that peace and that joy that we work so hard preparing to get. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we pray that you would help us to see our desire for peace and our desire for joy as a hint of the blessings that you promise and that you provide. Help us to see also the gifts you've given to us already through Jesus Christ so that we may be able to relax, receive what you've given us, 
and experience the joy that you promise. In Jesus' name, amen.